have the declaration slide. Can we throw that up there? Wonderful people. Okay, I love to start with this slide. Um, So can you just grab your Bibles if you have your Bibles with you or grab your phones or whatever it is, however you read the Word of God. And I just want us to say this together. Can we do that? Okay, I love my Bible. I believe that it is the Word of God. I believe I am who He says I am. I believe in its power to transform my life. I know that God will meet me in these pages. My heart is open to receive and I boldly declare I will never be the same. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray and then we're just gonna jump right in. Jesus, we thank You for today. God, we thank You for that time of worship where we were able to come and just to pour out an offering to You. We love You, Jesus. And in the midst of a busy season, Lord, I pray that You'll continually remind us what it's all about. And that in the days and weeks to come, that we will just have deep and sweet communion with You and with each other. And let us not take family, friends, and gathering with one another for granted, Lord. We thank You that You are good all of the time. We praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we are still in the Beatitudes. Who feels like this season, this series has been going on for the last year? Me too. I didn't get to I didn't get to speak all that often. And so there's a lot of these Beatitudes to get through. So you're just gonna hear about them for a while. Um, Who has been here for some of the last um, times that I've spoken? We've covered four of them so far. Yeah, can you all remember which ones? We just wanted to mess with you and jump right in the middle instead of starting at the beginning. So we started with, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Awesome. The Beatitudes here, if you want to, if you haven't caught any of the others, you can go back and listen to podcasts or on the YouTube, on the YouTube. <laughs> yes, clearly. <laughs> it's just water, no coffee today. I know. Um, on YouTube, and you can get a little bit more of the context of where this portion of Scripture comes from, but you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5, because that is where the Beatitudes can be found. And this is coming from the Sermon on the Mount, which is the probably most famous sermon that Jesus preached. And who knows that Jesus was the greatest communicator of all time. I love it. And I often think to myself, so many people know the Ten Commandments, but how many people know all the Beatitudes? Because this is the new set of standard that Jesus requires of us as believers, amen. And so these Beatitudes, they're keys in how we are to act towards God and with one another and the culture around us. They're attitudes, be attitudes, the attitudes in which we should be, attitudes in which we should embody. And this list of attitudes is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. It truly is. And we need to look at these and see how different the kingdom of God looks than the kingdom of this world. And these beatitudes, these list of ways that we should be as believers, they're pretty different than how the world tells us to live. Not only that, they're actually counterculture to how the world tells us to live. And the one that we're gonna cover today, I believe, is such a timely reminder for us all. And it is Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Who in this room is a child of God? Then you all are peacemakers, right? I love it how the Passion Translation says it, how joyful you are when you make peace. For then you will be recognized as true, as a true child of God. See, I think it's such a timely message that we find ourselves in in this day and age because anxiety is on the rise. Panic attacks are on the rise. Suicide is on the rise. And this world is literally dying for the peace that we carry. They are in deep, deep need for this peace that sustains. 
They need peace of mind. They need peace of heart. And we know that the only peace that lasts is the peace of God. Amen. Every other peace that you can find in this world is temporal and will fade, except for the peace of God that we find through Jesus Christ. Amen. I love what Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. His peace doesn't let our hearts be troubled. In Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your requests to God. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Amen. Who knows that in order to be in this world and not of this world, that we need our hearts and our minds guarded. And Jesus is telling us that the way that we guard our hearts and we guard our minds is through a peace that we cannot understand. As with every beatitude, the style of writing is cause and effect. If you do this, this will become the outcome. If you are meek, you will inherit the earth. If you're impure in heart, you will see God. And this is no different. If we are peacemakers, we will be called children of God. So this beatitude, it's a big deal because every believer should endeavor to be called a child of God, amen? And not just called one, but recognized as one. So it should be our goal to learn how to be peacemakers. So truly we would be identified not just by man, but by God as his children. So in a moment, we're gonna break down this scripture and go through a couple of different interpretations and how they apply to our life in a practical way. But I want us to look at this. If we look at what this scripture is saying, we can also look at what this scripture isn't saying. If we are blessed by being peacemakers and called children of God, what does the opposite of that look like? Perhaps the opposite of this text could be said. Cursed are the chaotic troublemakers and antagonists, for they shall not be called children of God. Matthew Henry says, for if the peacemakers are blessed, woe to the peacebreakers. St. Bernard puts it a lot more bluntly. <laughs> and these are his words, not mine. He says, the peacemakers shall be called sons of God who come to make peace between God and man. What then shall the sowers of discord be called but the children of the devil? And what must one look for but their father's portion? Ouch. Anyway, on to the good stuff. Um, <laughs> That was a side note. But it's serious and I want, us to, I want us to listen and I want us to read this scripture the way that Jesus intended for it to be, not just a mere suggestion on how we should live our lives, but really the rule by which we should follow in living our life. Because I wanna be a child of God. I want God to call me that. I want others to call me that. I wanna be identified as that. And so I'm gonna do whatever it takes to be a peacemaker and not a peacebreaker. Amen. I think it would be a miss to jump to the conclusion that peacemakers are passive bystanders that are not engaged in culture. Because that is not what this text is saying. But it is talking about the way in which we go about that. Because there is a right and a wrong way to engage with culture. And unfortunately, oftentimes we can't tell who the Christian is or not. Eleanor Roosevelt said, it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. So to be a peacemaker, it takes intentionality, it takes perseverance, it takes faith, but ultimately it takes trust. It takes trust in God. 
In Psalm 34, 14, it says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seeking peace and pursuing it is not a passive stance. We need to actively seek peace, the person of peace, amen? And we have a whole lot of Christians engaging in culture and the world and they use the tactics of the world. They're reactionary to the kingdom of this world and as a result, they look just like every non-believer out there. We have another group of believers who are so stuck in religion that they create discord, chaos, arguments and judgment against fellow believers and think that they're doing God's work. But in fact, they're not recognisable as children of God. This perhaps is one of the most sobering verses in the Bible for me. I know there are a lot of them, but this one in 1 John 4, 7 through 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. If we're acting in hateful ways, if we're hating one another or hating the world out there, it's actually more of an indication of our relationship with the Lord than anything else. We either love and know God or we hate and not know God. The two cannot coexist. We have to look at one another. We have to endeavor to love one another well so that we can represent God well, amen. We can't go around calling people names, hating other believers perhaps because they don't believe in the same theology as us. For if we do, it is evident in our life and to those around us that we do not know the God that we claim to defend. So what does it look like to be a peacemaker? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Billy Graham says this, to be a peacemaker, one must know the peace giver. Amen. Ephesians 2.14 says, for he himself is our peace. He is our peace. We cannot be peacemakers if we do not know the one who not only gives peace, but is peace himself. So first and foremost, we must be born again. We must know this God that brings peace so that we can bring peace to situations and circumstances and people and relationships, amen? Amen, let's break this scripture down. So if you look in your Bibles at this scripture, we're gonna focus in on the word peacemaker and what does that look like? So in the Greek, I hate saying Greek words. Are they just, they're just not complimentary to the Australian accent. (laughs) I just, oh. Or the Texas accent, let's be honest. Or really maybe any accent, I don't know. Irene uh, Nopoyas. <laughs> I'm sorry. There we go. Say that fast three times. Okay, it's actually made up of two other Greek words. Irene, which is peace, and poiano, which is maker. So we're gonna just break it down a little bit, okay? We're gonna look at this word peace and then separately look at this word maker. So this word peace here, it means a state of national tranquility. Well, I think we can all agree that our nation is not tranquil. So therefore we must need more peacemakers, amen? It means peace between individuals, harmony, concord. This word peace means security, safety, prosperity. It talks of the Messiah's peace. And here it talks about the peace that you and I have. And it is the tranquil state of of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. That is the peace that you and I stand in. A soul that is assured of its salvation through Jesus Christ, amen. Poyeno, maker, 
Let's look at this word. It means to produce, construct, form, fashion, to be the author of, the cause, to make ready, to prepare, to act rightly, do well, to carry out, to execute. And I love this one, to celebrate. So when we look at these words, the Scripture begins to unfold and gives us a little bit more of a clearer uh, intent, a clearer picture of this portion of Scripture. So it could be said that this word peacemaker is to be the authors, creators and executors of national tranquility. To make ready to prepare a place of safety. To construct, form, fashion, Security, to celebrate peace. So I want to highlight the difference for a minute between peacekeepers and peacemakers. Because I think oftentimes we use these two terminologies interchangeably and therefore confuse them thinking they mean the same thing. And they do not. A peacekeeper is a person who maintains peace They are a mediator. They often keep peace at the expense of something else. Either themselves, maybe their boundaries, others, their standards, their morals. They often mediate, help reach solutions through compromise. This is not the same thing as a peacemaker. A peacemaker is a person who brings about peace, especially by reconciling adversaries. So I want to look at this passage from two different, they're not opposing views and equally correct, but we're going to look at them for a second. And I want to start with the first one, and this perhaps is the most obvious one, is what does it look like to bring peace into an environment, a situation? and to the people around us, to the atmospheres around us. It's a good indication where someone's soul and spirit are by the atmosphere they create around them. Do you bring peace? Do you create peace or do you stir the pot? Do you agitate and antagonize? See, because if your soul and spirit are at peace, then you will create places and spaces of peace and you will be called a child of God. I have found that the people who carry the most peace are those who are the most secure in their identities. Here's the catch 22, right? To be secure in your identity as a child of Christ helps you to become a peacemaker so that you may be called a child of God. (laughs) And those who create the most discord, light the most fires, cause the most pain and create the most drama tend to be those who battle the most with insecurities who lack a confidence in who they are as a child of God. And ultimately, it is a lack of peace in knowing who they are that manifests itself in their lives and affects the people they love and the people they lead. So one of the ways that we become peacemakers is by being secure in our identity as children of Christ. It is not a lack of trust oftentimes in these people who cause discord and disunity. It's not that they don't trust God or His sovereignty. It is often a lack of trust in believing that they are who He says they are. It often manifests itself in competition. When you're competitive in life, board games are ruled out. (laughs) Football games, sports, that's not the competition I'm talking about because when that competition comes, like y'all are my competition. (laughs) Everyone's my competition. I'm just kidding. I love competition in that sense. I'm talking about more, you're competing with the people next to you in life. You're wanting what they have. They're more successful than me. God blessed them and He didn't bless me. 
That constant comparison is what reveals our insecurities and our identities that are not quite fully grounded in this assurance that we are children of God and that God is a good father. And something that most people who are peacemakers possess is an inner contentment. Not stagnant. They're not stagnant in their faith, but they're content. They have this peace of contentment that they're right where they're meant to be. That God is a good God. In order to walk in peace and bring peace, we must believe that we are who He says we are. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that we are the righteousness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Do we wanna know who we're following? Are we peaceful or confused? Do we carry peace into environments or confusion? Because that's a good indication who we're following right there. God is not the author of confusion. If we commune with God, with the God of peace, then our life should be overflowing with peace. We should be able to bring peace into any and every situation. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brethren, farewell, be complete. I have so many questions about those two words, be complete. That's for another day though, that's got nothing to do with this. But it's just interesting, be complete. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Romans 12, 18, here is a key. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. With what men? All men. It doesn't say live peaceably with your fellow Christians. It doesn't say live peaceably with the people who voted the same as you. It didn't say live peaceably with those who have the same ethics and morals as you. It said, when it is in your power, live peaceably with all men. All men. Does it say conform to this world? No. Does it say compromise your faith? No. Does it say water down your convictions? Does it say make the gospel more palatable? No. But it does say to live peaceably with all men. So to me, we enter into this tension that it is possible to live at peace without watering down our faith while we stand on our convictions why we love God and we love people. It is possible to be at peace with all men, even those who don't agree with us. So it is this beautiful tension that we get to discover and that we get to live in, amen? And it's gonna look different in every single relationship that you have. Do your best to live at peace with all men bringing peace to all relationships, situations, and circumstances. The second application for this scripture that I believe is, I don't want to say more important, but more important. (laughs) I don't know how else to say it. But it's often overlooked. And that is the interpretation of evangelism. One way we accomplish being peacemakers is through the spreading of the gospel. Because God has entrusted to us, you and I, the ministry of reconciliation. And the ministry of reconciliation is bringing peace between man and God. And the only way that that can happen is through salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.18, now all things are of God 
who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us, say committed to us, the word of reconciliation. So here's the deal. The word of reconciliation comes by the word of reconciliation. I know, you can take notes. But God uses the preached word, the gospel, to reconcile men and women to himself. And Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world, say all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And that word there, preach, it means to proclaim. To proclaim with a living voice. I love the quote, and I'm not sure who originated it. Preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. But it's not biblical. (laughs) There is some truth to it, of course. And we know that the intention behind it is true and it is good, but we can't let this surpass Scripture. (laughs) Too many believers quote that saying as though it was Scripture. And to be honest, I think we've used it as a bit of an excuse because we've been afraid to proclaim the Gospel. Maybe we've just never been taught how to proclaim, how to preach the Gospel to someone. I agree with the sentiment, which is to live a life that demonstrates the gospel. And we are to be peacemakers by the gospel being demonstrated through our lives. And I do agree wholeheartedly with it. We just cannot replace it with scripture. Because in my Bible, it says, go into all the earth and preach the gospel proclaim the gospel. And sometimes I think, if I can just shout loud enough against the pornography industry, if I can just shout loud enough against sex trafficking, if I can just shout loud enough about this crazy curriculum going into our schools, if I can just shout loud enough And do I think that we should lend our voices to those efforts and cause? 1,000%. I do, and I will. But it would be a miss to think that that is the priority. The priority is salvation. Because I tell you, you will not be able to put a Band-Aid on trafficking if you do not see those traffickers get saved. And you will not be able to put a Band-Aid on people who are writing these laws that are getting put into place unless they get saved. We gotta quit thinking that the world is gonna start acting like believers. The only way they will is if they meet Jesus. The same Jesus that changed us will change them. Amen. And if we can put our efforts to preaching the gospel and to reconciling men and women to God. But see, sometimes I think we underestimate the power of the gospel that we preach. We forget that the gospel of peace is more powerful than any carefully constructed argument that we may come up with. More clever quote that we put out on Instagram. And so we jump into the world's tactics and we begin to stir and we begin to agitate and we begin to throw stones. Because we're angry, right? I mean, we should be angry. That's not a trick question. Like we should be angry at some of the stuff that is happening in our world. But we have to use the weapons that work. 
We have to use the weapons that work. And again, I am not saying be silent in these places. We need strong believers in every single area of society, standing for godly principles. But let us not forget first and foremost, before God called us to any social justice cause, He told us to go and preach the gospel. It is our first mandate. I say this to people because it's derived from my life. (laughs) But evangelism is not a personality trait. It is a mandate. (laughs) And even if we're introverts, we don't get let off the hook. (laughs) But I tell you, I I think it's funny because that was me, right? I'm like, oh, I'm just going to leave that like preaching to the crazy, wild evangelists. You know, my husband, he can do it. The two are one, right? I'm just going (laughs) to. But here's the deal. Evangelism doesn't have to look the same in your life as it does the person sitting next to you. But it should look like something. And can I tell you the best way to preach the gospel is to share about the goodness of God. Because it is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. And so whenever I meet someone and I get the opportunity to share the gospel with them, I just start with my story because that's what you have. Or if I'm noticing that they feel like they're in a chaotic situation, I'm like, hey, I've learned to carry a peace with me that this world cannot shake and cannot touch. It kind of looks like you need some peace right now. Can I introduce you to the person who gave me this peace? We just have to make it relational. Reconciling man back to God is the ultimate role of a peacemaker. It is only through repentance and salvation that men and women truly change. And that is how we make heaven come to earth. We... um, we have three children. Our middle child, Asher, he, when he was born, um, I had several dreams just before he was born that um, he was going to come early. And he was our surprise baby. Um, a very big surprise. <laughs> our two ki- first two kids are 13 months apart. So I was like, wait, what? This is, this? wait, God, you're so funny. This cannot be, this cannot be real, right? Like, it was real. And um, anyway, we had been planning for a long time a uh, crusade in Colombia. And, you know, we had been talking to officials. Joaquin had been go- going down doing pre-trips. We'd been talking to pastors. And we were so excited for this crusade. And we just put all of our efforts towards this thing. And actually, Ben and Janessa were on that trip. That's where you all met, right? <laughs> You're welcome. Guys! <laughs> Go on a missions trip, you may just find your spouse. (laughs) That's good advertising right there. (laughs) Anyway, we had this crusade planned a lot longer than we, since before we got pregnant. Um, And then we found out that it was only three weeks before our son was due. Um, And so obviously I wasn't going. Um, But I had these dreams where I, the Lord explicitly told me that Asher is going to be born early. And so we're, we're talking, Joaquin and I, and we're like, well, you're going away. Like, are we okay with you potentially not being here for the birth of your son? And we actually both really felt a lot of peace on it. And I felt like because the Lord had told me and spoken to me that we were to still go ahead and make this happen. And sure enough, when he left, I went into labor. <laughs> and, um, and we had our son. And I just remember we were on a very, very spotty Zoom call, just trying to introduce him to his his son but I remember I remember my my prayer to God and what we had both declared and we said that Asher would get a double portion of um, the souls on his life that we would see one at that crusade 
And we just pressed in and we just were believing that he would have this gift of evangelism on his life. But the sacrifice that it was on our family for my husband to not be there at the birth, although to be honest, the sacrifice was more on my end than it was on his end. Um, I mean, just kidding, babe. You were, it was sacrificial on your end too. <laughs> Anyway, so we're just believing that for our child. And um, when Leif Hetland came just a few months ago, he, he prophesied over Asha and he said, you're a peacemaker, Asha. And I was like, oh, I wish that that manifested now, like in, <laughs> in his child, like childhood. <laughs> I'm constantly tearing him and his brother apart. I'm just kidding. I'm a pastor. I have perfect children. <laughs> Um, and I remember, and then Leif got down and he said, you don't just bring peace, but you put pieces back together. He said, you find broken people and you put the pieces back together and you find broken relationships and you put the pieces back together. You're a peacemaker. And it clicked in my mind when I was preparing this message is that was the thing that we had been crying out for, for him, that he would have, a, he would have an anointing to see souls won to the kingdom. And then to have this father of the faith come in and just affirm that. He didn't say it in the way that I would typically understand an evangelist to be, but ultimately that's what an evangelist is. That is what the ministry of reconciliation is. It is to put broken pieces back together. And what a gift that we get to do that. What an honour that God entrusts us to do that. To re-establish connection between Him and His kids. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful, how beautiful. <laughs> we just have to laugh for a minute and take a drink break. Wait a sec. Let's start again. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of Him who bring good news. Turn to your neighbour and tell them they've got beautiful feet. <laughs> How beautiful upon the mountains. I knew I'd lose you guys over that. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation and who says to Zion, your God reigns. Let us go out into Austin, amen, and said, our God reigns. How beautiful will our feet be? I love this quote. And in closing, famous last words from a preacher. I promise, one minute. Jim Wallace says this, anyone can love peace, but Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. He is referring to a life vocation and not a hobby on the sidelines of life. And here is our promise in Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I mentioned it earlier, but peace is a weapon. Ephesians 6.15, it's talking about the full armour of God. It says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is perhaps my favourite in Romans 16.20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. It's so interesting to me that he could have said, And the God who created the universe... And the God who is the judge. There was so many different words and names that he could have used in this scripture right here, but he chose the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Your peace is a weapon and we cannot keep it to ourselves. Peace is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. And in order for us to be called children of God, we must become peacemakers. So we got to bring peace to situations and not discord. And we've got to reconcile man back to God. Amen. That is ultimately how we become peacemakers. And I don't know about you, but I want to be called a child of God. I want to be recognised as a child of God. 
the world's tactics, they don't work. And can I just say they don't look good? They don't look good on us. They're ill-fitting. And finally, in this season of rest, this is a um, scripture that we've been talking about a lot, but in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That word rest there is also peace. And so as we move into this holiday season, I wanna just remind you that to go to Jesus and he will give you rest. He will give you peace. And if you don't live in this place of peace that you're hearing about, and if there's something in you that just kind of want to, wants to cause trouble, <laughs> let's become secure in our identities so that we are not troublemakers, but we are peacemakers. Amen? Amen. Now, could you all stand for me for a second? I just want to do one more thing before we leave. If there's any um, music, Jonathan, can we just put some on? I want to pray over us really quickly and then let you go. But I would be amiss to preach about the Prince of Peace and reconciling man back to God and not give people in this room an opportunity for that reconciliation to happen this morning. And so if you don't know Jesus, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, and if you desire this peace that not will, only will overwhelm your life, but overflow onto the lives of those around you, then I wanna invite you to come up the front and we wanna pray for you. We wanna pray for you. And we wanna lead you in a prayer and we wanna connect you. We wanna reconcile you back to God, which is where you were created to be. Amen. Amen. So why don't we bow our heads. Can we get the ministry team to come up the front? And just over here, on my left, if that's you, if you're saying this morning, Renee, I don't know this man of peace. I don't know this Jesus, this Prince of Peace that you talk about and I want to, then I wanna invite you to come up here and we wanna pray for you this morning, okay? And if you need anything else, any prayer for anything else, then I wanna invite you to come up to the ministry team. But Jesus, we thank you that you are the ultimate peacemaker, that you died on a cross to bring us back into a peaceful and harmonious relationship with God, our Father. And we thank you that we are called your children and we wanna look more and more like you, Jesus. So help us to bring peace into every Christmas dinner, into every extended family gathering into every place that our feet will tread. Lord, we ask you to overwhelm us with peace so that overflows into the atmosphere and the people around us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen.